Okay, welcome everybody to this uh, webinar. We're pleased to have uh, Roar Naibo with us today. I'm going to go ahead and just share my uh, screen here. Okay, so uh, Roar is a research scientist at uh, Drilling the Well Department in Sintef uh, Petroleum Research. He's going to be talking to us today about making sense of uh, drilling operations. I'm going to give just a little bit of a, a background on Roar. He's a research scientist, um, as I mentioned, at Sintef. He completed his PhD thesis on artificial intelligence and alarm systems and offshore drilling. And he's also worked on Sintef projects related to improved drilling automation, drilling support. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, we're going to try to present um, off of my laptop. Okay, so let's see. Yeah. I'll swap those and then, uh, Roar, why don't you go ahead and uh, request that you take control mm -hmm. of my screen. Yeah, let's say ask to control, request. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're approved. <laughs> go oh, ahead. That's great. So, um, I'm now in control of um, uh, <clears throat> Dr. Hengren's computer. And uh, welcome to this uh, presentation. <clears throat> I thought um, I'd say a few words about um, how we humans collaborate with automation systems and uh, when does this work uh, well, when uh, do we run into problems, and um, where are we going with um, with the work processes and uh, the technology development. So um, a bit of theory and uh, a bit of practical uh, uh, examples and um, how people and processes best can be organized around autonomous drilling systems. Uh, I have to um, uh, say that I don't have the answer to that, but um, uh, maybe we can open the discussion for um, uh, improved automation systems. So uh, a very simple uh, example that I think many of you are familiar with is um, uh, a drilling operation where you monitor uh, what is called the pit gain. Here is a very nice um, <clears throat> animation of how the drilling fluid goes through uh, the well, it goes into um, the mud pit here, and then it's circulated down into the well. So um, every driller knows that uh, this pit volume should stay unchanged if nothing is happening. If there is some gas entering the well, then uh, you're going to have more coming out of the well than you pump in. So the pit volume here will be increasing. Uh, there's, there are many ways, uh, many things that can influence the pit volume, but um, uh, if you have a gas, if you have a gas kick, uh, you're definitely going to see uh, a pit volume increase there. So this knowledge and these expectations about how the pit volume is going to, uh, to change, that forms part of um, uh, a mental model of the system. And the, the humans have a mental model of the system. The alarm system have um, a simplified model of the system that says that uh, there's no danger as long as the pit volume stays constant. And computers have a computer model, of course, of the downhole uh, system. And when you look at how uh, humans work with our mental models of the well, then we tend to work in two different modes. And this is, um, this is where the theory um, comes in. You have uh, one normal mode of work where you get new information and uh, you just slot that information into your uh, model. There are no surprises. Say you see the, um, the pressure goes up, 
Um, okay, that's because I pumped in some cold and dense mud, no problem. And um, the pressure goes down. No, that's uh, that's probably just uh, data quality problems. So um, there, there are no surprises, and everything fits well into your uh, mental model. And then you get to a stage where things doesn't fit anymore, and that's when you have to come up with um, a new model of the well. Uh, that's, uh, for instance, when uh, the, pit, the pit volume is uh, decreasing. You're seeing that um, we are losing mud to the formation, and that does not correspond to your mental model of the well. So you change it. Okay, there's a leak in the well, and you have um, you have reframed your mental model of um, of the well. And, and uh, as humans, we do that uh, pretty quickly. We come to a realization, and we have a brand new uh, m picture of the of the well in our uh, mind. Humans are very quick at that. Uh, I tend to use this uh, illustration to. Um, to um, illustrate the two modes that when you are in um, everyday day-to-day uh, -day work, you're just fitting the data into a frame. Um, you know uh, how, the, how the well works, no surprises, and then you get into a much more uh, complex reframing phase where you have to um, make up a new a new frame to uh, to fit all these new data points and new information. So this is how uh, humans do it, and we can uh, look at uh, how this goes on in an emergency with and without computers. Uh, Without computers, it's um, quite straightforward. You detect that there is a pit gain. Uh, there is a conflict with your mental model. So you reframe your mental model. OK, there's a kick. Uh, we have to uh, handle that and uh, quickly. With <coughs> computers, uh, again, the, you detect a pit gain. Probably it's the computer detecting it. You um, get an alarm, and again, the human uh, reframes his or her mental model and rejects the computer model. Uh, this is uh, this is where um, a problem is arising in uh, today's more digitized uh, drilling operations, because. Uh, the computer model was very good at triggering that reframing. It was monitoring all kinds of data channels um, every second. It was noticing, okay, there's a discrepancy here. It was sounding the alarm. But since there is a discrepancy between the real data and the model, that means that we can't, we can't trust the model anymore. It is wrong. That's how we uh, that's how we noticed the problem. So, in the in the normal mode of work, you have had uh, a very good computer model telling you what's going on in the well. Suddenly, you are in a crisis, and you can no longer rely on the model. This is uh, a bit of a problem, and there's uh, there's no time to um, change the model because uh, if I try to um, to model a kick in uh, in the well, then I have to specify where is the is the kick, when did the kick happen, how much kick, uh, what is coming in into the well. Uh, I don't have those answers, and um, the computer is unable to uh, unable to to give them. So, from this simple example, we can say that. In, we have two modes of work. We have the routine work where um, 
uh, well, we humans know what to do, but we sometimes get information overload, and uh, the computers are very good at this um, this mode of work. And this is uh, this is the mode that automation systems are designed to work in. So um, as long as we're here, we um, work very well together with the automation system. But then you notice something is wrong. It can be a crisis, or it can be bad data quality, something, uh, some mismatch, and that's when the computer systems fail us. Uh, and this is also, uh, luckily this is when um, creative people is really uh, is uh, really shining. So I thought um, I'd give an example, a practical example of um, uh, one, such, one, such, one such example of um, uh, a change in pit volume, and then a colleague of mine uh, was studying what happened in the organization when they were trying to resolve uh, this problem. This is um, you can you can find the um, the whole story in this uh, paper here, but I'll uh, uh, re relay them uh, a summary for you. So it started with missing mud and you people wonder okay why why is the um, is the mud uh, missing what is uh, is the cause and while in the normal mode of work you had the driller minding uh, his uh, his well and the others were minding their business but suddenly uh, the whole organization um comes into play and everyone is talking with um, with everyone else and they were coming up with different uh, ideas about uh, what this could be. Uh, okay, are we losing mud to the formation? That's um, one hypothesis. Is there a leak on the, on the rig? No, we can't really see anything on the rig. Uh, somebody found uh, logs from a nearby well that uh, a different team had been uh, drilling. Okay, they saw something. They saw something similar. Uh, okay, so are we seeing the same thing? Uh, no, this uh, that was at a, at a completely different depth. So it has nothing to do with deformation. So new hypothesis. New hypothesis. Uh, well, maybe we have too uh, high mud density, so um, the mud is leaking into deformation. We have uh, fractured it. No, and they even came up with um, uh, one hypothesis about chemical reactions between the mud and the formation. So that the formation should be able to handle this uh, mud weight, but maybe it has um, dissolved or something because of uh, the mud. Uh, well, uh, that's a completely new idea, but it's also a new mud system, so, well, who knows? So, these are just um, IDs, but the interesting thing here is that uh, this had nothing to do with checklists or um, with uh, ordinary procedures. They were not following any rule book. Uh, it was just... Um, geologists and drillers talking, uh, these are usually in their own silos uh, in normal modes of work, but suddenly now you start to um, look at all the interactions that you um, hide away in, uh, in ordinary uh, modes of work, and chemistry is, uh, is uh, one of those things. When you, when you are a driller, you look at pressure, you look at flow rate, but you don't consider chemistry. So it's the same drilling operation, but suddenly the complexity of the drilling operation uh, is a lot higher. It's a lot less efficient, but everyone is talking to everyone else. Um, completely outside of um, normal work processes. So 
after a while, um, the mud logger goes and uh, inspects the shakers. And it turns out that mud is passing over the shakers. It's uh, clinging to, um, to the cuttings. And uh, nobody has foreseen that uh, this, was, this was going to happen. And it was not the mud logger's job to go and inspect uh, the shakers. But people went outside work processes, they went outside their roles, and that's how they resolved uh, the problem. Maybe, as a, maybe the shaker hand could have uh, spotted this, but uh, he had a lot of other things to do, so it was not on his list to, uh, to check the shaker at, um, at that time. And you can, um, you can imagine uh, how, how should an automation system handle a problem like this. Uh, there was nothing in the um, uh, real-time data logs that could have told you about um, this uh, this problem. It was not visible to the sensors, and computers don't inspect trail shakers. Computers don't consider anything that um, they have not been uh, programmed to inspect. But the organization uh, solved this, and this, this took uh, it was just a matter of hours. Uh, it happened in the morning. I think it was uh, it was solved by um, by evening. Uh, so going back to the um, to these two modes of work, this example shows that uh, as soon as you enter into this reframing mode, you have uh, a much higher complexity. Uh, so a driller has to think about chemistry, the geologists look at other wells that um, were not part of the operation, and all these boundaries, these silos that we set down um, to divide, divide labor uh, just dissolve. And um, everyone is going outside their own roles and their own work processes. Uh, and this is, uh, humans are great at this, uh, but automation systems are not. If you, uh, if you don't, if you don't specify um, the system boundaries for, for an automation system, you can't, um, you can't make it uh, work. Is, there, is the system going to include chemistry or not? Um, so, how do we move forward? How can we uh, how can we make computers help us in this situation? That is uh, is far from um, is far from clear. But if we take um, if we take a step back from uh, and look at the larger trends in the industry uh, over the last years, there have been uh, some great expectations about um, how drilling is uh, going to evolve, how the oil industry is going to be modernized. If you call it integrated operations, smart fields, uh, intelligent um, energy, uh, two of those um, expectations is that we're going to break down the data silos. So um, data is going to be shared uh, everywhere, be, be accessible, be connected, and people are going to be connected um, onshore, offshore, geologist and driller. Um, a lot of work has gone into integrating people and into integrating computers. So this, these are two of the um, two great expectations on drivers. Uh, now the third one um, is automation. But there's a, there's a paradox. Uh, when the industry talks about automation, we talk about computers taking over tasks. We talk about 
humans supervising a bit from um, afar, and we're not talking about integrating humans and uh, computers. And this is uh, this is a real this is a real problem because, um, as we said, as we, as we um, have seen, automation systems they have a hard time changing their mind. Uh, we we cannot, um, or we can, but today we do not have um, uh, a drilling model that can track um, as things evolve in, in the well. Uh, if, if the drilling model is wrong, uh, we have no time to uh, correct it. We know that automation systems need precise um, boundaries and uh, this people integration uh, has actually put stricter system boundaries on people as well. Uh, this is uh, not discussed a lot but we know from the Norwegian continental shelf that when you went from um, having the whole organization on the rig to moving things onshore with uh, onshore operating centers, expert centers, um, and sharing experts between different um, uh, different rigs, then you had a lot of, you had great uh, integration of people perhaps, but you also developed um, greater bureaucracy uh, when you worked uh, integrated onshore and offshore, um, everything um, was laid down in more strict procedures. That's what we uh, we have seen um, on the Norwegian continental shelf, at least. So, people who had been who were used to working the old way uh, felt that working in, in an onshore operating room was um, uh, well, there were a lot, lot of extremely much paperwork, and um, you have to you have to follow the procedures. You have to um, follow the uh, the work process, and we have seen that um, the onshore operating room uh, there's a sort of an assembly line thinking uh, in the organizations. You talk about um, standardizing the team and uh, standardizing uh, competence and um, information sharing so that it will be easy to um, exchange one person with another. Uh, sort of a standardization of, uh, of people. Uh, this means that um, both the new work processes and the automation systems are restricting uh, people when it comes to that um, reframing phase. Uh, and uh, let's see. Um, mm, oh, I'm missing, I'm missing a slide here. Uh, but um, some of you might be uh, be familiar with uh, the automation uh, roadmaps that uh, companies like um, NOE have proposed. I uh, don't know if we have any from uh, anyone from NOE here. Mm, no. Uh, anyway, they um, imagine that we gradually um, let the automation system take over um, control. That you can. Uh, automation system first uh, suggest uh, something, you have the, the human approving it, then you move on to um, an automation system that works on itself and the human just um, monitor it, monitor it, and um, just an increasing automation, more autonomy, more autonomy, and there is no um, corresponding roadmap to what uh, will change with the user integration. 
this is um, quite understudied in uh, in automation. Uh, it's also quite dangerous because we know from um, other automation industries that um, when you automate and um, push the human away from the day-to-day -day, uh, work, uh, but still require the human to um, jump in when there is a crisis, then the human uh, no longer have a good mental model of, um, of the system. So um, the more you automate, uh, the less able we are to um, handle the reframing phase. So these are um, these are all the trends that are going in the in the wrong direction. On a more uh, positive note, uh, we have had uh, and we still have a very interesting. Um, um, synergy between technology and work processes in the oil and gas uh, industry, where things work on um, depend on each other. So um, some years back, we we finally got these um, video conferences between onshore and offshore facilities, and it was only after the um, fiber optic cables were installed that the work processes. Uh, came about the new work processes um, that are required to um, collaborate onshore and uh, offshore. So the work processes build on top of the new technology, and we're seeing that the new work processes we can build new technologies on top of those again. Uh, for instance, there's. Um, project we in Sintef hope to uh, start up next year, where um, we're going to use the fact that we um, put mud loggers onshore. We're going to use that to um, bring in more sensors and more automation uh, on the rig. And when that's in place, we can uh, build further with work processes on top of that that might in might involve um, uh, the mud logistics and the ship uh, the ships that are um, transferring mud to and from the the rig so this is an uh, there's an upward spiral where um, technology and work processes and competence build on each other and Today, we have a lot of new tools and new work processes that we didn't have um, just a few years ago. And uh, here are just some of the tools that, um, that we could use to address this uh, reframing problem. Uh, uncertainty and data quality is, um, is interesting because uh, bad data quality is the most common uh, source of reframing. Uh, you could have a situation where uh, the pressure in the well is um, uh, completely different from what your model tells you, but then it turns out that uh, the model has the wrong uh, diameter for the um, drill string or somebody dumps um, a lot of barite into uh, the mixing tank without uh, informing the drilling model. So there's a lot of low-hanging fruit where we could start to um, um, automate a little bit of the reframing. There's um, been a lot of work uh, done on uh, good work processes around uh, data quality, better data infrastructure. Uh, there's a very good paper that came out recently uh, on that really represents the state of the art in data quality, so I urge everyone to have a look at that. And um, colleagues of mine have been uh, looking at how automation systems can reduce uncertainty about um, the drilling operation. Uh, that was because that was uh, one of the um, 
things we saw in the example with uh, the missing mud, that to resolve the problem, you couldn't analyze existing data. You had to go out and you had to acquire new data. And automation systems can do this. They can uh, uh, run experiments, test a hypothesis. If I increase or decrease the um, uh, pump rate, how should uh, the pressure change? And if um, if I have the, the um, rheology of the fluid wrong, then I'm going to uh, to notice. So you can tune your uh, model uh, automatically, actually, uh, with an automation system. And we have, and have had for a long time, the tools for evaluation of this. Uh, when you have an automation system uh, which is unsure about something, you need to weigh the costs and the benefit. And what is the cost of acquiring new information? What is the cost of um, pulling off bottom and circulating to um, calibrate your uh, readings? This is uh, this is something that we can put a price tag on. It's uh, it has been done, and uh, it has is, it is being used in the industry by humans. But we can uh, automate this. Um, we can make cost um, analysis on the fly, and we have today we have a lot of uh, experience from reservoir engineering in this um, in this area. I think uh, reservoir engineering has the um, opposite problem, really, because the reservoir models are being updated um, automatically based on new seismic data, based on uh, production data from, um, from wells. And uh, the reservoir engineers are actually complaining that um, the computer model is ahead of them. It's the um, mental model of the reservoir engineer, which is uh, lagging behind. And um, of course, big data, artificial intelligence, there's a lot of um, uh, big hype around that. But uh, we are seeing um, quite concrete tasks for um, artificial intelligence in helping us. Uh, it can be in uh, interpreting uh, a request like um, um, model this kick. And we can um, build up a model on the fly of the kick without specifying uh, anything in detail. We leave that to the computer system. And uh, we're also seeing a bit more um, acceptance of uh, the need to maintain these computer models. Uh, we have had this mindset that when the computer model um, <coughs> doesn't work, you just reject it. But computer models are not really that different from uh, um, machinery on the rig. Uh, you have to calibrate sensors, you have to oil your machinery, you have to uh, do maintenance on the pump. And the same thing really applies to the computer models. And if you can spread that mindset, I think uh, that uh, a model maintainer could be uh, a new job description on the, on the team, on par with uh, Mudlogger and, uh, um, and Roughneck. This is uh, that's one avenue we could um, could explore. So um, these are some thoughts about uh, where we could be could be heading. We have uh, we have a real problem. We have um, a roadblock to increase the automation of the drilling um, process. But I think if we are able to um, innovate on both technology and work processes and user interfaces at the same time, we can really make um, some progress here. 
And that uh, concludes my presentation. Thank you. Excellent presentation, Roar. Um, let's go ahead and get started with some questions. Um, so, let's see, Roar, you have uh, control of my screen, so I'm just going to take it back just for the um, question and answer period, if that's okay with you. Um, okay, let's see. There we go. Okay, so uh, you can ask a question either in the chat window or if you'd like to uh, ask a question, just unmute your microphone, um, you know, either either one. Um, Roar, I'm just going to get started with uh, a couple questions uh, that we already have here. Uh, so you mentioned, um, you know, maybe not full automation, uh, you know, and, the, and you mentioned several, you know, very good uh, scenarios where, where you you know uh, this reframing uh, automation system may not be able to capture that. Um, but how could you give some thoughts on how simulators may be used to help with the reframing process? Yeah. <laughs> See, your microphone is still up there. So. Uh, well, one um, one typical um, problem is um, that we don't understand um, the mud as uh, well as we like, and um, we we have the drillers um, mixing in uh, barite in um, in batches, and uh, this is not reflected in the in the drawing model, but it's uh, quite simple in theory to do a parameter search um, and say, I have, um, what if we change uh, the mud rheology? Could that be an explanation? And you can find uh, that, okay, for these uh, mud rheologies, we have um, a better correspondence with the measured data. So that's a viable hypothesis. And then we can uh, build a test framework around that. We can say, okay, how much do we expect this? Um, what is our uncertainty about uh, the drilling mud? What are some other hypotheses? You can, um, you can use a very rigorous mathematical framework to um, test different IDs, as long as you can uh, represent the situation in, um, in your model, you can um, think about it in the model. So that's, uh, that's one way that um, models can help us with, uh, with reframing. We could have uh, some intelligent agent um, coming up with new ideas about uh, what's going, going on, and you can have people on the rig going out and testing those uh, ideas. Like um, make a measurement from the mud pit, check if uh, the density is uh, what you think it is. Mm -hmm. Those are some great insights. Okay, I'll open up to uh, other questions from the audience. I was just going to I was just going to make a comment. So, while I don't disagree with your answer to John's question, I think that there's a role to play for additional instrumentation as well. Um, so, so it's great that you can look at cases with your model and try to figure out, you know, what's going on. I think that's absolutely a really valuable thing to do, but I think there's a place for a consideration of additional measurement on the rig or improved measurement, because as you mentioned during your talk, a lot of uncertainties or problems that we encounter that perhaps break our confidence in the model have to do with measurement quality issues. So, so it seems to me there's room for additional measurement as well as better quality measurement. Yes, uh, I uh, I completely um, agree. We we have actually um, an ongoing project with Sutton and um, Oishman where we look at uh, <coughs> uh, inline measurements of. Roy, your microphone is up again. Oh, sorry. So uh, um, actually, I agree with uh, with Lisa on this because we have um, 
We have an ongoing project with Statoil and uh, Hoisman where we have put sensors on the um, uh, on the flow lines so that we measure the rheology of the mud going down into the well. We measure the rheology coming up, and um, we are going to use that to um, detect if there's um, has been any uh, changes to the mud, and we can detect if the mixing went wrong. We can use it to uh, improve and automate the mixing. So um, sensors are definitely um, uh, needed. Glad we agree. Good comment, uh, Lisa, uh, and, and great response uh, as well, Roar. Okay, so any other, um, any other questions? Okay, uh, Roy, I just had one other question uh, for you as well. Uh, you know, I think everybody's aware of the lower oil prices and uh, how that affects automation. Uh, what examples have you seen uh, that would either encourage or discourage automation uh, due to the current economics? Well, no, there is um, there's one case that we um, we hope to um, to work on next year, and that's. Um, the mixing of um, mud on the rig, because that um, is largely um, done manually, and it's <coughs> it's a difficult process. You have um, you don't have enough sensors. Uh, you have a large vari uh, variation in the raw materials, and uh, you end up with um, mud of the um, wrong composition or the uh, wrong uh, volume and uh, you mix muds uh, into the wrong tank. So uh, we are working with, uh, with the industry to um, address that through uh, automation and uh, using existing automation systems plus um, better models of the um, uh, drilling mud to make even more autonomous op operations. Uh, this is a cost driver, not um, not just because uh, mud is costly, but because you have um, to ship excess mud onshore. So uh, maybe your tank is full and you have to wait until a ship arrives, you pump it onto the ship, you have a lot of CO2 and money uh, spent on uh, on that ship. So um, that is quite inefficient, and uh, with a low oil price, we have we're seeing uh, uh, that well, we want to cut uh, costs uh, where we can. It's uh, it's delaying the drilling operation. Uh, and that's uh, that's a ma major cost driver, perhaps. So it's, it's also interesting that um, uh, this is uh, it's, it's often a question of chemistry, and chemistry is uh, is uh, largely missing from most um, most computer systems and automation systems related to uh, to drilling. We have a lot of work done on pressure and um, fluid dynamics, but the chemistry is there, and uh, maybe not um, during normal operations, but when you have this reframing um, phase. Uh, suddenly, the chemistry starts um, starts to matter. So we we want to bring the chemistry into the um, automation systems. Great. Okay. Any uh, last questions for Roar? Okay, Roar. Well, thank you so much for the great presentation. Um, and as we mentioned, I'll go ahead and post this um, online after the um, you know after this talk and. Uh, Great, and thanks everybody. Well, actually, we, we do have a question in the chat. Uh, let's let's take this one. Mud mixing is only part of the automation issue. Tank cleaning is a major issue as well. So, um, anyway, any last thoughts on that as well, Roar, or is that? Yes, uh, tank cleaning is um, is uh, important and. Uh, <coughs> if the situation is bad on the rig, it's even even worse on um, on the ship. We have heard from um, people in the industry that um, you order mud 
uh, from onshore uh, and um, the ship comes out to uh, your rig, it turns out that uh, the ship didn't clean their tanks uh, before they shipped your mud and uh, when they say that they've pumped all the mud uh, aboard, maybe 10% of the mud is uh, still left in the ship tank. Uh, and we think that uh, the reason why the quality of that um, service is so bad is because it's not being measured. And uh, this is uh, something we want to um, attack with sensors. We want to have um, sensors onshore. We want to have sensors um, measuring what's coming from the ship. And um, some of my colleagues would like to see uh, sensors uh, in the fluid uh, in the ship. We want to have um, um, quality control uh, at each step of the um, um, mud logistics uh, chain. This is uh, this is something that is um, standard in uh, onshore opera onshore um, uh, industries, but um, we don't see it uh, offshore. So that's um, that's something we can uh, we can really address with um, with sensors. And uh, of course, automation comes in with auto automated analysis and. Uh, you can look at um, logistics optimization. There's a lot of very interesting uh, opportunities there. Great. Roar, this has been uh, excellent. Great thoughts about how to involve humans. At least I like how you brought up the question about you know, additional sensors, and, and uh, that's a great response on, on adding sensors. Um, for the uh, the tank. So anyway, everybody, thanks for uh, thanks for joining. I'm going to go ahead and stop uh, the recording now.